evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome once again to Conversation for the third time, uh, Ravi Batra. And uh, Ravi Batra is going to be familiar to many of the people in the viewing audience as the author of the book that was very near and on the best-selling list of the New York Times for a year, called The, Depre the Great Depression of 1990. And it was followed by the book that did very well, also was on the best-selling list for a considerable period of time called Surviving the Great Depression of 1990. And Ravi Batra is now in New York, and he has the new book out. It's newly published, but uh, written some time ago called The Downfall of Capitalism and Communism, subtitled Can Capitalism Be Saved? And Ravi Batra, welcome very, very much once again to Conversations. Thank you. You wrote this book, as you, as you indicated to me before we went on camera, you wrote this book some 13 years ago or That's so. That's right. In 19, Maybe you could fill us in. Huh? In, in 1977, uh, I, I wrote this book, uh, and I tried to find some publishers in America for it, uh, and they all turn, turned me down, so I went to England to find a publisher there, mm -hmm. and Macmillan Press then published it in 1978. Okay, good. And, and the fact that uh, people keep saying that nobody foresaw the downfall of communism shows you how much attention was paid to this book at that time. You're used to that, right? No, I'm used yeah. to that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yes. the prophet in your own time is never as honor in his own time. <laughs> but it is really true. You've had, a, you've had quite a track. I wonder if we might even be able to back up a little bit from that. You've written on a wide variety of things. You wrote, if I'm not mistaken, on... A predicting the war that was going to emerge yes, I, uh, yes. between Iran and Iraq, yes. uh, other things. Maybe you could share a little bit of your own background, if you could. You've, you've made a number of projections, and I particularly want to speak about that because projections that you've made, not only here in the area of economics, but general projections, have had an uncanny sense of, even though very often on the surface of it, seeming outlandishly impossible, have come true. Maybe you could fill us in a little on your own background, if you would. That's uh, the, the, the forecast that I have made have been mostly based upon the theories I've talked about in this book, yes. uh, the, the, the downfall of capitalism and communism. Mm -hmm. I wrote this book in 1977. It was published in 78. It went nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I was very convinced of uh, my forecasts. Uh, so I then decided to openly talk about uh, uh, the Middle East, for instance, and I said, you know, the, the, the Iran would be in, in revolution in 1979, then there will be Iran-Iraq war in 1980, it will go on for seven, eight years, uh, and be, be finished uh, not before 86 or 87. Mm. But these are all based on historical cycles which I have discovered, which I had talked about and discovered in the downfall of capitalism and communism. I see. Okay. And the book for which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, the, I'm most well known, that that book, The Great Depression of 1990, was right. in fact written six years later in 1983. I see. Okay. And, and, and it was also based on the theory, theories uh, in the downfall book, but uh, hardly anybody knows about that book because nobody paid attention the intellectuals in, in 1978 laughed at the very title of this book. Yes. You had the same title then in 78? That's right. The title was the same. Right. Exactly the same Didn't title. Yeah, right. The Downfall of Capitalism and Communism uh, was the title, and the title is exactly the same now. Uh, and so intellectuals laughed at the title. Of this, course uh, they're going <laughs> to laugh at that title. How could it possibly be that communism is going to have any difficulty? It's so well established in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe that you could never see the downfall of communism. That's right. Right? Because that's that, what everybody would have said. That's right? what they were uh, saying, mm. that communism is simply invincible. Yes. Of course, and everybody knows that. Supported I mean, by a, a nuclear-powered army, at, with atom bombs and all that. How can it, it disappear? And I said, well, the, the, the power of the theories that I talk about in, in this book, mm -hmm. and, and the theory has originated from my teacher. Yeah, we want to talk about that. Right, yeah. my teacher P. R. Sarkar, it is his theory. And I said that theory has not been disproved over the past 10,000 years of human history. Mm -hmm. it, it is that powerful a law that he talks about. So I am very convinced that my forecast uh, will be right in the future and only time could tell. And I, and I said, it's just a matter of 10, 15 years from now that you will see 
communism falling and capitalism falling at the same time mm -hmm. and, and, and both systems will be gone by the year 2000. Okay, we want to talk about that. Particularly, I think there's going to be a number of people in the audience, uh, the subtitle is, Can Capitalism Be Saved? Many people, as you understand, now are celebrating the downfall of communism and thinking that means that it's the inevitable, uh, you know, victory of capitalism now until the end of the universe or something of that that's sort. That's precisely right. But, that's a, that, but before we do talk about this, as it relates to the United States and the Western economies and so forth, could we talk some of oh, Mr. Sakar? He's your teacher, your mentor, yes, yes. a very important person that's not well enough uh, known here in the United States and in the world scale. That's maybe right. you could fill us in a little bit on on, on, on uh, Pierre Sarkar, if you would, please. He, he is a very smart man, very intelligent man, and he has written on a number of subjects, including economics, history, philosophy, religion, society, cr criminology, on all sorts of subjects he has written and offered very original views. Uh -huh. His views are very controversial in, in India also. He's a he very lives and resides in India. Then. That's in yeah. Calcutta. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he's very controversial there. And... Uh, uh, it is his one law that I've been talking about again and again and again in, in different books yeah. and making predictions based on that law. In, in the Great Depression of 1990, I talked about economic predictions mostly, but in, in the downfall of capitalism and communism, I talked about political systems, what will uh, replace capitalism and communism, uh, why are they are going to disappear and when they are going to disappear, so I talked about some political cycles, but they were also based on Sarkar's law of social cycle. And that's just one aspect of his uh, vast knowledge. Cosmology, or a, a view of the universe that he's a comprehensive seer. Very comprehensive. Visionary, he's a yeah. seer and visionary, and I've uh -huh. talked only about one aspect. And from that just one aspect, all the forecasts that I've made based on that one aspect have so far come true. When you say that one aspect, what, what, what do we, what, what? Although that aspect is very comprehensive, he talks about history of civilizations, how societies evolve, and when he talks of society, he includes every aspect of society. Economics, politics, government, feminism, uh, religion, philosophy, intellectuals, uh, acquisitors, business, every aspect he talks about. It's in, a comprehensive, in, he's a comprehensivist. That's right. And he would deal with universal mind or universe. And he will deal with universe. Uh, he's talked about creation of the universe, and uh -huh. the theories offered based on uh, how the universe was created and where it's going, yes. Yeah, that's interesting and a priori mysterious universe we live in, I think. Yes, uh, but with his theory, we may make it... Or he has a, if I may, he has a, uh, he has a, uh, a, 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 in a certain sense, a deterministic quality to the way in which we can see human affairs, that it's a... No, he's not really deterministic. Not. He's not a determinist, but mm -hmm. he says that nature has uh, uh, followed, uh, or, or nature has declared, you so to speak, certain laws and we are bound by those laws. Mm -hmm. If you discover those laws, you can discover the future, you can analyze the past, but within those laws, human beings have total freedom. And the other sentient beings as well, the flora, flora and fauna, is there, a, is there room within the nature of consciousness itself for synergistic, uh, unforeseen, yes. as it were, outside of the parameters of a certain deterministic uh, Cosmology? That's well, right. We are, we it's, are bound. It's not locked in. To no, we're not system. locked in. We are uh -huh. bound within the universe, uh -huh. within the uh, laws of nature. Mm -hmm. But uh, once uh, 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 within those laws, we have total freedom. Uh, it depends on the, our actions. Uh, the, the results and fruit will depend totally on our action. Mm -hmm. But the action, the, the arena within which the action is to occur is bound by natural laws. Yeah, right. I, would, I don't want to go into great, uh, Buckminster Fuller would have said that we are in a a priori mysterious, that there's an a priori mysterious design to the structure of universal mind. Well, he does, there's an a priori his mystery theory is, made up of a series of resonances of inter-accommodative consciousness. But, but Sarkar's theory is to remove these mysteries. He said there's nothing mysterious, just because we don't understand it, we call it mysterious. But it's not mysterious, it, there are certain laws uh, which uh, apply. But even 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 phenomenon. at a level, at a at at, at another level. Yeah, even at be... the level of the cosmos or cosmic mind or cosmic consciousness, there mm -hmm. are rules and laws. 
So he, he starts with the... So it's all inclusive in a certain sense, yes. beginning with the beginning of the universe. Precisely. You know, so. Coming Precisely. out of a Hindu or Vedic tradition? Or no, no? Uh, somewhat related, mm -hmm. but, but I think he's in the universalistic outlook. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's related somewhat, but not, uh, only maybe 10% of his philosophy comes out of... Uh, uh, the Vedic uh, uh, tradition. I see. I heard you say he's controversial very, in India. Yes, very controversial. Why? What is there that is controversial? What makes him controversial, if I may? Or he, what are the main? He follows the truth to the hilt. He's a man of principles. That's a difficult. That's a difficult position to be in, and yes. sometimes in this world. If yes. you are a man of principles, then you practice what you preach. Uh -huh. Then the establishments are going to hound you. Those who are in power are going to condemn you, denounce you, and, and that's why he has a tremendous following. People love his ideas, the logic behind them, but uh, the establishments hate him. Why? Well, he has challenged, for instance, the power of the priesthood, that they, they, they exploit people, and they have been doing it over for five, six uh, thousand years. Mm. He has challenged the and the notion that the, 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 there is extreme concentration of wealth and that's responsible for our poverty. That's true. So, I mean, that's true. That, well, all these are true, yeah. true statements. Uh -huh. and, and because of his dynamic personality, he's attracting following, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, the establishments are afraid of him. Uh, they are the establishments in India, yeah, in India. And to the degree that they understand what he's saying would be in opposition to him probably in other parts of the world, that's including right. the United States of America, where United we are States. now, right? Yes, yes. They probably would be in opposition My, to him. My books also have become very controversial for the s simple reason that they oppose injustices in society. Uh -huh. They oppose the, the fundamental injustice that we can see, particularly, do you think particularly so in the Western world or in the United States? Or? Yes, in the United States, if you look at the 1980s, yeah. uh, the number of billionaires jumped from 15 in 83 to 66 today. Good Lord. Oh. That's 400% rise, a number of billionaires. Mm -hmm. People say, well, this must be due to inflation. But inflation, I thought, has sharply come down in mm -hmm. the 80s mm -hmm. from the level in the 70s. Mm -hmm. and, and then, at the same time, the number of homeless also jumped by at least 1,000% in, mm -hmm. in the 80s. I know, it's amazing. And, and that's, that's an amazing uh, contrast, uh, an ama amazing coexistence of Plen total plenty on one side and so much misery on the other side. Total plenty on what is a smaller raft uh, of people that are on that raft of plenty, I think, is becoming more and more narrow. And you pointed out in your books the concentration of wealth. Uh, I think when we talked to you last that it had reached the point where it had been throughout in the 60-year cycle that you saw for Great Depressions, it had been in the 20 percentile Right. Uh, for the upper 1% ownership of capital assets. It had gotten up close to 36 or 37%. Right. percent. No. still hold? Is it, is it's it, now is it moving close in that to 40%. Direction? No, 40% yes. of the capital assets of the United States economy are owned by the upper 1%. 1% of society. And that can be documented. The, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, there's history. plenty and of you're an, you're an economist. Not but, just plenty yeah. of evidence, uh, documentary evidence. Uh, there are all these... Uh, uh, magazines are talking about, look how, how, how rich people have gotten, how the, the rich have gotten so rich. Michael Milliken made uh, 550 million dollars salary in one year. Who is worth that much money in, in one year? Uh, but that's the kind of system we have, and yeah. I have found. We yeah. have a minimum wage. We should maybe have a maximum wage. Law, right? yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, right. Well, it turns out if you compare the minimum wage with that maximum wage, it will be at least uh, 100,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit absurd. Isn't yeah. It? yeah, it is indeed. Yeah, and, it, and then if we carry that on a little bit further, what 40 percent? That's because these and things move glacially. Yeah. These changes move glacially. That's an incredible kind of uh, and, and concentration these, uh, of wealth. And such concentration of wealth in the end brings about a great depression. All right. I wonder if we could talk about the concentration of wealth. We could. 40% in the upper 1%. Um, perhaps we could say virtually or nearly all of the capital assets owned by the upper 5% of the American yes, economy. Right. Yes. Fair to say? Fair to say that. More or less. Then we have a social, economic, uh, particularly an economic system that is made up of a number of very highly paid executives who must necessarily be sycophant to that ownership class, as That's it right. were, who administers institutions of employment, which is supposed to administer wage, uh, I don't want to use loaded terms and so forth, but wage-based, or in the Marxian analysis, wage-slave trickle-down notions of income 
to the broader population and much of that doesn't trickle down even to those at near the minimum wage or beyond and they litter our streets that, that's right with the homeless in a, in a fundamentally well, unjust way is that more or less the way yes. you see it yes okay. that's the way i see it and look at the injustice of it mm -hmm. since 1970 the average earnings the, the average real earnings have fallen by 15 percent mm -hmm. in spite of the true mm -hmm. that's that's from the president's economic report mm -hmm. i mean that's the president's own economic report shows you that real earnings of uh, a working man a working person have, have fallen by 15 percent whereas productivity worker productivity yes has gone up by 30 percent. Well, all right, yeah, that, uh, yes, right. Now, okay. they say, you know, capitalism is, is a kind of system in which people are paid what they deserve. That's mm. what they claim, you know. Mm. If your productivity has gone up, how come that your earnings are down? Mr. Say would turn over in his grave. <laughs> right. you know, how come or, your earnings or, or are Adam down? Smith would, for that matter. Yeah, well, and, they, and the answer, yeah. how come your earnings are down, is that more and more of the worker productivity is being... Uh, uh, is going into the pockets of the top 1% or the top 5%. Surplus the, value labor? Sur that you believe you ascribe to that notion, right? Well, I, I it's don't Marxist, use that, it's, it's, I don't use that concept, but it, it is true that part of worker productivity is going into the, the pockets of the likes of Michael Milliken, yeah. who make $550 million uh -huh. for ruining the country's economy. Yeah, you get to be highly paid if you can do such a thing as that. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a highly paid job, right? You basically single-handedly destroyed so many uh, businesses in, in the United States. Yeah, but with that pattern of uh, ownership, uh, I, I, because there was another side of that equation I would have liked to have thought about, because you're familiar that I am closely, as it were, in a certain sense, in a mentorish kind of way aligned with Louis Kelso, mm -hmm. who has been attempting to establish one uh, light in this economy of ours that I have been able to see, which is the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, the idea being to spread ownership out yeah. in recognizing this concentration of wealth equally well, uh, uh, as you do, he does. But his notion is that we should, uh, that the contribution of the, of the capital assets or the technology to the production apart from the human input or the, uh, the, 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 the labor into that process, is increasing through time. I mean, so that I had a friend, if I may, who came back from Japan where they told of a factory that turns out high quality television receiving sets that are of the highest quality and that there's not a single human being working. They come out and it's mm. all robot, yes. robot, robot, robot. Who owns the robot? But the point is that the technology is increasingly responsible for actual production. Or do you factor that into your thinking? Oh, that, yes, I factor and, that. That, that increases and isn't your... Sir Carr uh, involved, if I may, again, to your mentor, to the idea that there need be an expanding of ownership among all the people yes. if we're to move toward a fundamentally just social, economic, political system? Well, he, he calls it a co cooperative system. Yes. Uh, what, what your ESOP is, 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 is a cooperative system to him where... Uh, stocks and bonds or factories are owned uh, collectively by the employees and their representatives yeah. manage the factories. He, he certainly believes in that and he has, so written, yes, uh -huh. he has written about that. Uh -huh. In fact, he, he has a, his economic system, uh, is, he calls it proud. Yes, right. And proud's economic system is based on these co-ops. On, on the notion of co-op and cooperative ownership. Ownership, yes. Is it cooperative, if I may, to make a small point, nitpicking, I hope not. Yeah, it's, but the uh, idea, is it, is it owner, private property ownership on the part of individuals? There is, yeah, on, on, on in small businesses. In, yeah. in large businesses, he says there's, there should be co-ops, uh, uh, like uh, employee stock ownership plan. But in mm. small businesses, like restaurants, uh, service businesses, private uh, individual ownership I is fine. This is almost getting into jargon. We needn't do it, but I don't know that an ESOP necessarily is like a co-op. There could be a difference, and there are some other aspects yeah, there, there, there to could be, yeah. infrastructure ownership and that sort of thing within the, the Kelsonian vision. And Well, I, w I, I certainly am going to be reading Mr. Uh, I want to get in touch with uh, Mr. Uh, you know, Sakar, your teacher, mm -hmm. and read of that. And uh, I would hope people might do well to be in touch with both Mr. Sakar and I would say Mr. Kelso, mm -hmm. particularly an expanded vision, sure. as they all are. Um, and we also want to let them know a way in which they could, con uh, though the viewers who might be viewing now, 
it would be possible for them to be in communication with those who are involved with this philosophy? I believe you have an office in uh, Washington or something? Yes, uh, there is. Uh, and also in, in this new book, uh, I have given the addresses uh, uh, where, where people can uh, uh, get hold of Sarkar's books. All right, that's good. That's very yeah. good. Okay, that's good. Then that will be a good reason for them to get the book. That's uh, uh, that all right, that's one, one and then to that point, while we're on the point, or while we're on the subject now, is that this book, and we want to get to the book, we've been talking around it in a sense, but uh, it is possible, let's mention at this point, we'll do it at the end again as well, uh, it's possible if people want to make uh, a telephone call, they could uh, get the book. Maybe, maybe there's a number we could let you yes. let us know about that now. If yeah, you there is an 800 number. Yeah. See, the book was uh, printed uh, just in one week ago. Some yeah, this is March. 16th, 1990. Right. And, and the, 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 some bookstores have it, some don't. This one's still practically warm. All it's the time. <laughs> right. And so uh, one way to uh, get hold of this book is to call an 800 number. What is that number, please? It's 1-800-541-4042. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Or 1-800-541-4091. And especially if you want autographed copies, an uh, autographed copy. yes, then they should definitely call uh, the, this this number. Autographed by you? That's right. I'll, I, Not by uh, some staff member. No, 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 no. no, no, no autographed no, no. by the Ravi by, by by the author. Wow, yeah. that's great. Uh, that's that's good. Okay, and we've I get lots of letters from people. They yes. send me books by mail, and then I auto autograph them for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there is a demand for this. So I figured, why not do it through this 800 number? It's good that you get a lot of mail. You to start, you try to uh, warn people and have tried to move the society toward a grassroots movement that might be able to head off this depression that you see could have such disaster. Yeah, effect. I feel that and, there uh, will be a great depression, which will then bring about this the downfall of capitalism. Okay, let's talk now about this. Communism, obviously, in 1990, has the events in Eastern Europe make it obvious that communism uh, at least is 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 coming up. The, the bringing down of the Berlin Wall, the events yeah. are moving so quickly. That part of it, uh, of your book, the downfall of capitalism and communism, is something that we see before our very eyes now, That's uh, right. which you saw years ago. Years ago, yeah. Congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> In a certain you, sense, I'm being well, I'm correct. happy to see the downfall I think I would like to take you to the racetrack someday if you would like to <laughs> just go with me. But in any event, you <laughs> see this thing. But now the side of it, uh, there is, of course, you're familiar, Francis Fukuyami. Uh, many people here in the United States are celebrating the end of history, the inevitable and forever triumph of the Western capitalist model and so forth. You say that the capitalist system is also in a tremendously perilous uh, situation and is likely to uh, fall also. Yes, all these people who are celebrating the fall of communism and the triumph of capitalism they are going to be as surprised as they were by the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to come as a tremendous shock to them because capitalism has its own contradictions. Mm -hmm. And it's just a coincidence that both systems will be falling, falling at, at just about the same time. It's mm -hmm. just a coincidence. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, there has not been much interaction between the two systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, so capitalism is going to be falling because I found that whenever in the past the wealthy were dominant in society mm -hmm. and the, uh, there was a tremendous jump in the concentration of wealth, as a result that of that concentration there was tremendous uh, economic depression and then at some point in time as a result of the depression the system disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we are at the same point now there is the dominance of the wealthy in the U.S. and mm -hmm. the Western world. The acquisitor class, the too, exactly. within a larger historiography. That's yeah. right. If yeah. you, the acquisitor class is in power, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the concentration of wealth is as high as ever, even higher than before, much higher than before. Forty percent is incredible. Yes, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, uh, and at the same time, there's a rising class of homeless uh, people, and people without insurance, uh, I mean health insurance. So that whenever these kind of uh, injustices plague a society, then uh, uh, I find the, the rule of the dominance, the dominant class, their rule is gone pretty soon. This is made worse and more disquieting by opening the newspaper to read the headlines of a president who proposes a capital gains tax. Uh, this I, further I going to benefit the uh, 
the the upper class that has so much capital and doesn't know what to do with it now anyway? It is, it is inc simply incredible uh. to me that in the 1980s they reduced income taxes again and again mm -hmm. and income taxes are mostly paid by the wealthy mm -hmm. but at the same time they, ro they ro social uh, increased security. social security yeah. tax terribly yeah. every year they mm -hmm. kept raising it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, in the past 15 years social security tax has risen 27 times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, or, or it's the other mm. way around. In, in the past 27 years, it has, risen, it has been raised 15 times. Mm. So today you're paying 1,000% more in social security tax than what you were paying in 1970. Mm -hmm. And this tax is paid mostly by the poor and the uh, middle class. So after all that has happened in the 80s, they want to now come back and reduce capital gain tax further and even possibly eliminate it and another boondoggle for the wealthy. For but, the, but I think that they're going, they're this, by doing this, the wealthy are going to dig their own uh, grave, so uh, to speak, because there will be a, a, the end to capitalism. Yeah, the, the Laffer curve and the idea that this will be invested in good productive uh, use. You, what would you say to the critics who would say, well, here we are, we have our unemployment relatively low, the business cycle, we've been on a boom, we haven't had a recession, the stock market has gone up 2,000 points in the last decade or so and so forth. What do you say to the boosters of the capital? I will system? say to them that suppose I had the ability to borrow 150 billion dollars a year from the rest of the world, I'll become rich without working. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what America has been doing in the 1980s, borrowing uh, almost 150 billion dollars a year from the rest of the world mm -hmm. and that's What's, what is financing our prosperity. Mm -hmm. But that's no prosperity. No, no. I mean, you, you are accumulating uh, liabilities and one day you have to pay them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if suppose you, you had all this prosperity without incurring any debt, which is what we had in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. During the 70s, in spite of all the inflation, 20 million jobs were created. That's again from the President's economic report. Mm -hmm. And again, about 18 million jobs have been created in the 1980s. That part is true. That's, but at the same time, $3 trillion in debt has been built up. Amazing. Yeah. So what's better? Jobs without debt or jobs with debt because someday you have to pay off the debt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so all this uh, talk of economic miracle of the 80s is pure nonsense because pretty soon we have to pay off this debt and if we can't pay off, there will definitely be a depression. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is no way we can pay it off. And we, and we become hostage to other nations. And, uh, mm -hmm. hostage. That's mm -hmm. the amazing mm -hmm. part today. Mm -hmm. in, in 1980, I remember 1881, all the other, other economists were very gloomy about the future. They, they were saying we, we are going to have very high inflation, very high oil prices and the stock market will be stagnant, unemployment will be rising, we are going to have stagnation in the 80s. And at that time I said, no, 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 we are going to have the opposite. The 80s will be the last hurrah of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Every system has to have a last hurrah before it will die. Mm -hmm. The 80s are going to be the last hurrah of capitalism, tremendous prosperity, j a tremendous jump in stock prices, falling inflation, merger mania, all sorts of things, all, uh, like, things like these will Moral decay. Decay, of course. Well, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. They will happen mm -hmm. in the 80s, mm -hmm. but watch out for the 90s. Mm -hmm. So I find it, it's, it's highly ironical that in 1980, when America was free from any dependence on, on Japan, the, uh, my fellow economists were very gloomy about the future. Today, in 1990, America is highly dependent on Japan and they're very optimistic about the future. I can't mm -hmm. understand. Yeah. I just can't understand what, what takes them. It's just like those who said in 1929, before the crash, that we were on a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, plateau of prosperity, plateau of prosperity <laughs> That's just right. before the break came. And, I mean, the, the Great Depression came. That depression came. We did continue. The system continued. Do you think this dep You see this depression? Do you still hold? I don't want to put you on. You know, I mean, because these things can't be done with precision and clockwork precision. Do you still think we, a depression as far as the, let's say, United States, Western economy is imminent? The depression, as you predicted in yes, your book, uh, in, in this my year, book, 1990? I wrote that book in 1983. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I made predictions for the 80s, 
So far, not a single one has been wrong, That's if I right. may say so. Mm -hmm. And then I said that there would first be a stock market decline or, or, a, or a bursting of the financial bubble in Japan. Mm -hmm. And my deadline for that bursting was the first quarter of 1990. Mm -mm. That, right. that, that's now. That's um, right now. We, just end, oh, we have six more days, I think. And the Japanese bubble started to burst in February. Mm -hmm. It has? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, you're more aware of these things. <laughs> yeah, it has. 16% what, what decline in the stock values since, since uh, January of this year. 16% uh -huh. and, and, and they don't even understand why the values are falling uh, week after week. They're trying to uh, uh, prop it up but the, the, the stock market bubble in, in Japan has burst, and that's right on schedule. Really? Yeah. Now, this is, will this become a galloping thing? How will this... Okay. People are still coming on and boosting the system every day on television. I mean, how, how will this take... What, What's what, going what, to what do you foresee over the next okay. two, three, four, five, six, seven, twelve months? Yeah, what, what I'm going to... What I see now is that the stock market decline in Japan will continue uh, with minor upward rallies. And they have already lost, lost more than a trillion dollars in, in stock values, uh, more than a trillion dollars in, in two months. No, really? No, I'm uh, not oh, kidding. See, I can't understand. Okay, please, go yeah. ahead. I'll more than a talk. trillion dollars mm -hmm. in, in stock values has been lost in mm -hmm. just two months. Mm -hmm. Now put yourself in, in the picture uh, in, in, uh, of, a, of an investor yep. who has his job, but he's lost all his money, all his savings. Mm -hmm. He is not going to be going out in the market and buying more things. Yeah. Uh, he will be very, his, psych, his psychology will be very depressed mm -hmm. and he won't be spending anymore. Mm -hmm. So I expect that in Japan uh, there will be a pretty sharp fall in consumer spending which will then create unemployment inside Japan. And Japan is a big importer of things from the rest of the world. Of course. So Japan is going to have a recession soon and from there the recession will spread to the United States, uh, not only because Japan imports a lot of things from America, but also the Japanese investors invest money in America and buy the U.S. government bonds. Absolutely, I know, I know. They've been propping it up, haven't they? Now, once you've lost so spending binge, yes. Huh? Once you've lost so much money, you don't want to invest anymore. They're going to start calling some of that stuff, maybe. That's huh? right, and yeah. so there will be a sharp rise in interest rates in America in, the, in this year, mm -hmm. and overnight. Almost overnight, there will be a recession this year. A recession onto a depression? That's right. And no depression starts as a depression. Yeah, it always start starts as a recession. recession. Uh -huh. So this year, we will have a sh sharp recession. Mm -hmm. Next year, that recession will become a depression. A, a depression. And if I may, we have uh, recessions, depressions, and then Great Depression. A Great Depression? That we will have a Great Depression by the end of 1991. Good Lord Almighty. What does this spell? In terms of the broader fate of the world, this is a this is this is a if this does come so, and you feel and you have been uncannily correct in your uh, pronouncements and so forth, what does this uh, the broader implications of this sociologically, politically, and so forth that you see? This could be a this will be a calamitous. Uh, it will be calamitous situation in terms of the consciousness of most people. It will be so bad that it will bring about an end to the influence of money in politics. Lord. People will find that it's be because money has so much influence in politics that all the tax laws, laws are biased towards the wealthy. Social security taxes keep rising, income taxes keep falling, they're even talking about reducing capital gains tax, mm -hmm. while uh, the, the number of homeless is rising, people without health insurance is rising. Mm -hmm. So they'll find that all the laws are biased in, in their favor because money has so much influence in politics. I think people will demand that that role be eliminated, and it will be eliminated, I think. And, and that, that, to me, is a social revolution. It'll be, it'll be eliminated through the uh, democratic political process? Yes. It, it would be, be, yes. It wouldn't... Uh... No, it, uh, it won't be because of bloodshed or, or violence, because I think uh, Western countries uh, have e developed institutions which give way, uh, uh, which give expression to people's resentment. It takes some time. It takes a crisis to do it, 
but such uh, institutions are there. That's interesting. It'll bring around in the in this in the if, 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 if the uh, Sarkar and his view of the people who are uh, dominant in the society, the uh, warriors, the That's inquisitors, right. bring, the intellectuals have tended to have a cycle way of having their influence. And it was a piece in the newspaper the other day. The President Reagan, who had unlimited power as president and is now a free man in the society and so forth, is now going and accepting two million dollar fees from the Japanese yes. to give a to give to give an address. And it said that uh, President Ford and others of these people who had such tremendous political power always felt that the tremendous wealth of the people, the corporate heads, they admired that wealth and mm. were almost in a certain sense sycophant to it. it yeah, understand. well. What's likely to emerge would be in the in the in, in, in terms of the United States would be us in a sense a political warrior class, a transference from a, a society dominated by the acquisitors and the acquisitor ethic? Or what do you see emerging from such a situation? Well, that's the, the we, if we look at history, and I've talked about a political cycle in, in history in, in this uh, downfall of capitalism and communism book, uh, we, we find that uh, in simple terms there are three main sources of political power just three main sources. One is military, the other is intellect, and the third source of political power is money. So either the society... Or wealth, yeah. We were saying, yeah, 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 right. money or wealth. Mm. So society is either in the age of the military, or in the age of intellectuals, or in the age of the acquisitors, or, or, or the wealthy people. There are, there are only three such uh, systems uh, in the world. And has history sort of allocated uh, equal status to those three classes? That's exactly what Intellectuals we find. are... Uh, uh, um. Like intellectuals, whenever people rule with the help of ideas only, mm -hmm. no money is involved, no physical might is involved, just ideas. There has been such a time. Yes, priesthood. Uh -huh. okay. All the priesthood, whenever priests rule society, they rule it with the help of some scriptures. Mm -hmm. The scriptures contain ideas. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. That's the age of intellectuals. Oh, I see. Sometimes uh, they were uh, like when some prime ministers uh, uh, dominated the king through their advice. Yes, right. People think the king is the ruler, the real ruler is the prime minister, right, the advisor right. behind the scene who is giving all the advice, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. has the king under his thumb. Mm -hmm. So we find in history that uh, there is a, this political cycle that uh, which Sarkar calls the law of social cycle. Mm -hmm. He says every society was first dominated by the military, then came the rule of intellectuals, after that came the rule of the acquisitors, then and the then rule of the rule of acquisitors ended in a social revolution. In, in that revolution the influence of wealth from politics was eliminated. Once that rule was gone the warriors came back to power, or the uh -huh. military came back to power. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, applying that theory to the modern world, yeah. I find that uh, monarchy or dictatorship are really systems of the past. We now will have democracies. Democracy is the wave of today and the wave of the future. But democracy will have different character Today we have acquisitors' democracy. Yeah, money. Money yeah. dominates this democracy. It sure it's does. Acquisitors' democracy. Yeah. And for the Soviet bloc, I predicted that they will have intellectuals' democracy. Uh -huh. There will be elections there, but money will play no role. Uh -huh. As you saw, elections in, in, in Russia and Poland and Czechoslovakia That's have right. occurred. That's right. But money has no role to play. No, there. no, it's people. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Merit. Yeah. Intellectuals that are they, they're dom they are going to dominate. In America, we will have a warrior's democracy. A wa warrior's democracy. Warrior's democracy. Uh -huh. We'll still have this democratic system, a free press, freedom of speech, human rights will be respected. Uh -huh. But the president of the United States or the vice president, the, the people in the executive branch, today they come from business class. Business By and large, and they're lobbied tremendously and, and very yeah, And they have the backing of wealth. Yeah. Yes, right. In future, they will come from the military class. Military in the sense of soldiers? Army officers. Uh, really? Like, if, if, you, if you look very carefully, you will find that America began as a warrior's democracy. Mm -hmm. Who yeah. was George Washington? He was the uh, father of our country. First-rate soldier, yeah, accomplished warrior. Yeah. 
and he did not need a penny to get elected as the president. That's right. So merit was the basis of his election. Mm -hmm. Merit will be the basis of elections in future also. And merit can, can come from your uh, military prowess mm -hmm. or it can come from your intellect. And I, I, what, I, what I'm predicting is that for the Soviet bloc, it will be intellectual democracy. For the Western world and also India, by the way, mm -hmm. there will be a warrior's democracy because it's the turn of the warriors to rule in the near future. Uh -huh. It, 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 wh wh why is it different in the Soviet Union and the United States? Or, the Soviet or Union uh, or the Soviet bloc for the past two centuries has been in the age of the military. So these things change from group to group. Where there's regional considerations of who is in this, not uh, right. overall the no, whole no. of the earth. Right? No, it's, it's every society. If, if suppose the earth were to become one society, yes. then we will have one cycle for the whole earth. Uh -huh. But until that happens, each civilization has its own cycle. So the Soviet bloc has been in that age, the age of the military for over the past two centuries. They are going to move very quickly into the age of intellectuals. So that's the cycle. That how, many of these, how many of these civilizations do you uh, tend to identify? I mean, uh, I have studied uh, regional. I have studied in this book. Yeah. I, 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 have, uh, there's, I have added a new chapter to this book. Remember, this book was written in 1977, yes. but this is now the second edition. Mm -hmm. In the second edition, I have added a new chapter talking about the 1990s, and in that, I talk of the whole world. I find that. Uh, Russia and uh, the third world countries of Africa mm -hmm. will be moving into the age of intellectuals uh -huh. pretty soon. Good, yeah. Whereas uh, the Western world, India and Latin America will be moving into the age of uh, the warrior class mm -hmm. or they mm -hmm. will have warriors democracy. Uh -huh. China and Japan will not see much change, if, if any, in, during the 90s because China had a major change in 1949. Uh -huh. They moved from their age of the wealthy to another age of warriors. Uh -huh. See, that's the cycle. Okay, Cy th yeah, that, that, that's pretty complicated. There's so many different cycles coming from different civilizations, but you talk about that in I talk the, about the, whole and world. the permutations and that we could just like a computer model or something to get it's a, very actually, to no. get a, can you get a systems record in, in, in cybernetics, they say information overload with this tremendous change. And then one wonders also about that chaos is likely to accompany a real depression that you're saying is coming. There will be great human suffering and That's great right. chaos and so forth. But uh, there is a saying in cybernetics that information overload of a system allows pattern recognition. If we were on a spaceship or we were away from the Earth, would we be able to recognize an overall pattern that collectively humanity is about to enter? If we were to take yes. the permutations of these various yes, regional you can, you differences. Can, uh, you can identify an overall pattern. And what is that pattern? That pattern is that we are now moving toward a golden age. The mm -hmm. whole earth is moving toward a golden age where uh, the rule of money will disappear mm -hmm. and the rule of traditional ideas, the, the respect for old orthodox ideas will make a comeback. Those that's, that are, oh, go ahead, sorry. That's the pattern for the whole earth collectively. So you ultimately have a very optimistic vision. Very optimistic. Very optimistic it's, it's, despite this long-term uh, Suffering that we can probably look forward to throughout the 90s that is going That's to accompany right. the, the downturn one decade, and the, the death throes of this yeah. old system, as it were. The decade of the 90s will be a decade of destruction, mm -hmm. and the following decade will be a decade of reconstruction. And in that reconstructed world, we will see golden age rising all over the world. Uh, today, so many countries are poor, so many people are all Absolutely. poor, that yeah. poverty will disappear. Yeah, and the systems that we've inherited from the, hi the history-bound systems that we've inherited, much of the philosophy, the uh, thinking of Adam Smith, the thinking of uh, Karl Marx, the thinking of the institutions that we have inherited are not in and of themselves adequate without major transformation or uh, a major philosophical, economic, political transformation in order to meet the challenges of ushering in this new Not age. Not at all. We're leaving, it's, it's, it's a new historical system. birth or a context of yes. being that is liberative in its final uh, analysis as you see it, perhaps? Yeah. Or in, see, as it can emerge. Yeah, we, we find a that... A birth, perhaps. Is right, it's the birth of a totally new era. Uh -huh. We find in history that uh, 
after chaos, after a crisis, emerges a new system which is better than the old. Because there is this, this pattern of human evolution, social evolution has continued in the past and will continue in the future also. Uh -huh. So after this decade of chaos of the 90s or the decade of destruction will arise a new system which will be much better than all the systems that the world has seen so far. Uh -huh. will, will there not be uh, some solace in the fact that there are some philosophical systems, let's say, such as Mr. Sirkar? Or in my case, I might say, Mr. Mr. Kelso, Kelso yes. uh, has uh, but thought these are, through... But these are thoughts of the future. Uh, ...have thought through these things, has made some lay assigning contact with consciousness that has been embedded in a historical context, and gives us some uh, system of understanding to which we could repair in order to gain a sense of uh, navigation through, not only the, through to the promise of the liberation and the new era, but also through the difficult time that we do have ahead. There are these visionaries and seers that are people that we could uh, repair to and we would do well, all of us collectively, to be looking for alternative notions of social, political, economic organization and systems that perhaps have been thought of as being outlandishly outside the, quote, mainstream. That's right. Uh, and that it's there that we should be perhaps as citizens and as uh, uh, our, maybe even our responsible leadership should be looking for points of navigation, as it were, yeah, trail markers, we should, we to get us through this difficult for, period. We should be looking for alternatives in their ideas. Uh -huh, uh -huh. See, the, their ideas represent the future. Uh -huh. the, the past is the capitalism, communism, those are dying, and uh -huh. they will be d gone by the end of this century. Uh -huh. And the future ideas will come from Mr. Kelso, from Mr. Sarkar, uh -huh. and they will then uh, bring the birth of a new age, uh -huh. uh, you might say, uh, uh, and, and that new age will be very, opt uh, which will be very, very good for the whole world mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it will elim eliminate poverty. We will not mm -hmm. have the same disparities mm -hmm. that we find today. That where uh, that, that uh, minimum wage and the maximum wage could differ by a hundred thousand percent. Such disparities will it, disappear. It would be laughable if it weren't. It would be laughable That's if right. it weren't so tragic. The, the and it so weren't tragic. that there were so many people that were being. Uh, literally physically and morally and spiritually, even those who are in positions of great uh, uh, favor uh, within the system are spiritually and morally disinherited. There's a great malaise within decadent the... Decadent. Decadent is perhaps the right word. Marie Antoinette, I think you said at one time in <laughs> yeah. your book, The Age of Marie Antoinette and yeah. the Deficit Queen. So all of these things are, 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 part of, are part of that pattern that we see now, but we're coming into this new era that you can see that could be a positive era of uh, prosperity and elemental justice. There's a term I often use on this series, and I don't want to bore my visit, my viewership who watch often, but I use very often the term that uh, James Joyce has Daedalus use, uh, and that is history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken. It has a certain notion of uh, time and so forth that we would be perhaps awakening from a nightmare of uh, so unjust social, political, and economic systems under which we suffer at the moment, perhaps unknowingly by most people and so forth, and that uh, it is a, 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 an opportunity a, that we may be opening upon this kind of a new era. One worries about an atomic bomb-laden world and about the possibility of the chaos bringing the destructive capability that there has been built up in the atomic and the hydrogen and the bacteria, binary bacteriological weapons, chemical weapons and so forth, there could be, the, we have apparently the ability to destroy our species or make a habitat incapable of it. The averse side would be something on an order of allowing us to see elementally a just world or a liberated world that many of the prophets and seers of, uh, of historic time have uh, pointed us in the direction of? Yeah, we, we are, in spite of uh, all the destructive weapons that, that we have in the world today, we are definitely moving toward uh, a liberated human consciousness mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact that the trend is upwards. Mm -hmm. uh, human evolution has, 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 a, has had a positive trend throughout history. And, and so the new system that arises, mm -hmm. like democracy was much better than whatever 
prevailed in the past mm. before it mm -hmm. similarly the new system and I, I think the new system will be proud mm -hmm. uh, all right well the, there is a model that people can model, that's they right. should be in touch with that and think about it right exactly and measure it with others and let there be some comparison between other yes. ideas particularly alternate right. ideas yeah. I think the new system will be proud uh -huh. and then people will realize that the likes of this has not never uh, has not existed before on earth yeah, and they should have some sort of an opening upon the idea of that which seemed impossible is not only impossible, but it comes increasingly a probable. Well, so yes. it's a privileged time in a certain sense in terms of the evolution of consciousness to be alive and participant. That's Never right. in the history of the uh, evolution of consciousness in this part of the universe have we been privileged to be uh, at a time of such a qualitative transformation in the broader evolution of universal consciousness and the human role within that broader evolution, uh, the transformation right. of uh, transcendent, transcendent to human consciousness? No, it won't mm -hmm. be transcendent. Mm -hmm. we'll, uh, it will be a, a sort of balance. Uh, mm -hmm. Today we have run, the, our lives have run away from the balance. Mm -hmm. uh, we are too money-minded nowadays, too materialistic, mm -hmm. so we have run away from the uh, spiritual values of truthfulness, honesty, uh, respect for authority or discipline, all those are gone. Mm. So what uh, this new system will maintain, will not maintain, will restore uh -huh. this balance that, see, human uh, existence has three aspects, um, physical, mental and spiritual. Uh -huh. Today, uh, the spiritual is totally disregarded uh -huh. and people are after the physical uh -huh. and mental is also increasingly be becoming uh, uh, marginal, marginal yeah. and, 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 and exalting all the physicalities. Mm -hmm. So that, that balance is gone, that's why there is so much misery. The new system will rest, simply restore this balance and, and then peace and tranquility will, will return. Within the, within the context, as Mr. Sakar might say, I would very much like to meet him at some time, uh, it might say within the context of the universal laws of the universe that are operative we could become involved uh, we could become uh it would be within the laws that are generalizingly pr yeah. principles that are operative and so forth and uh that we so that we would be able to gain lay us on with those spiritual moral and other values that we bring from history yes. and perhaps get rid of some of the dross and perhaps in a almost like to use the metaphor to go full term we've come nine months and it's time for us to leave this <laughs> womb and to move into, into another new, kind new of age. consciousness and we probably do well to look for other and alternative notions we have our poets we have our uh, philosophers we have our artists and others who haven't been particularly well received. we also have some other political systems there are interesting things emerging in in europe there'll be social democratic systems and so forth and we yesterday met on a, a brief program where i thank you very much for coming in and briefly meeting uh, dr ali trachy who is the ambassador of libya who in this country is de has been demonized by this country and yet if one were to investigate that carefully that would be another system of social organization that is attempting to deal and to attempting to construct some alternate view of uh, dealing with a situation that could move beyond wage slavery and so forth. It's interesting that this capitalist system would have so demonized that system that they're trying to do. I want to thank you for participating in that thing with them. We should be looking for alternatives. Then. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Both of these systems will be gone by the end of this century. We should be looking for alternatives, and the alternatives, believe me, will, uh, will be very pleasant. The alternatives will be pleasant yes. for the masses. For the we'll, masses, that's it. and not for the establishments. That's true. It will be. Will it be? Will it be? Will it be pleasant for not only the masses but for those who have been responsible for these historically inherited institutions, the establishment? Can it be a situation that's so comprehensively appropriate to the structure of universal mind that allows for each part of that to participate maximally, yes, like in a it, jazz it can band? Be. So that the people who, uh, so that it can be inclusive of everyone with no one losing? In the end, I think even those who are in establishment today will be happy with the new system. Mm -hmm. uh, but initially they won't be because, see, it's like uh, a person... Your with books. The, with the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Suppose a person has cancer and he mm. goes to see the doctor mm. and the doctor has to give him surgery, do surgery, surgery on him, gives him a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. But after the pain is gone, the patient is very happy. Yeah. So these, these establishments are like that. Uh, they, they are so deeply greedy 
the, uh, they don't see that they have billions of dollars, millions of dollars, want even more. Mm -hmm. So once uh, they, uh, they are purged off their greed, etc., even they will be happy that a new system did come. And where we might be able to have a broader system that would make it possible for people to live without the insecurity that must be behind greed. Precisely. There must be a psychological or spiritual insecurity yes. that motivates greed in a, in a paradoxical way. Emptiness. Emptiness. Yes. And if the conditions were such that it could allow for that, it might be one that could allow, because we are an organism in a sense. All of the human society is, we can draw up Gaia principle, sees us drawing off. All of the human uh, society is made up of, uh, as an organism, as well as the rest of the biological system. Uh, and is then there. happiness Happiness lies in a balanced life, not in one-sided living. And it also, it also resides in terms of an organism in each of the cells of that organism functioning healthily and happily and maximally, mm -hmm. perhaps, in order to have an organism, a runaway cell. If your pancreas is doing very well and the rest of your body isn't, that's cancer. That's and we cancer. have that now. And you mm -hmm. have a prescription for us to perhaps move toward a holistic understanding of the need for the whole of the human society to be able to be liberated yes. from the oppressive institutions that exist now so that all of society can participate in this song of the cosmos mm -hmm. or this uh, pathway in the universe of, uh, to use Mr. Fuller's terms, a, a synergistic resonancy that will inter-accommodate us to universe at a level transcendent to what we've been throughout the human experience. It's mm -hmm. a time of birth and a privileged time to be alive, I think. We'll in in that respect, that, yes. Despite all the difficulty that's coming. That's right. Once again, the 800 number where people would be able to receive the book. Let's give them that. Uh, right it's 1-800-541-4444. Uh, four, 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 oh, okay, fine. Autograph. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Listen, you bet, them, uh, I, I just want to say to you, 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 you know, you, you, you want to make sure of that because that might be an awful lot of signing for you to do. That's all right. And is it going to be a real signature or is it going to be a yes. computerized signature? No, no, no. Is it going to be your my, signature? And in red, red pen. Red, red pen, pen, quill pen, quill pen, what kind of pen? No, red pen. No, <laughs> red, uh, uh, the real uh, thing, right? This is pen. Oh, that kind of pen. Okay, fine. All yes, right, right, uh, okay. once again, the 800 okay. number is 800-541-4091. Uh, the book might be there in some bookstores, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. to, to definitely get, get hold of it, this 800 Okay, number. fine, fine. Well, okay, that's really good, and the, there's information about Proud and other things that are in it's there. It's all there. And yeah. it's highly recommended, obviously, and Ravi Batra, it's once again such a pleasure to see you. Uh, Thank you. And I wish you all the very, very best in this book, an extremely important book that ought to be read by one and all. And I personally think that this book, which, remember, was written in 1977, mm -hmm. is far more important than uh, my number one bestseller, The Great Depression of 1990. You heard it here, folks. Okay, fine. Pleasure to have been able to present for you. We're running right out of time. Pleasure for you to present for you one of the seers of our time, if I may say so. Uh, Dr. Ravi Batra, author of The Great Depression of 1990, uh, The Surviving the Great Depression of 1990, and now hot on off the press of the downfall of capitalism and communism. Ravi Batra, once again, thank you very, very much for participating in conversation. Thank you. As always, great pleasure. Okay. Good night. We'll see you next week.